I'm Kingston Mills. I'm the head of the School of Biochemistry and Immunology here at Trinity College and I'd like to welcome everybody to Trinity. And um, so I, what I'm going to do this morning is give you a, a, a flavour of what we do in the School of Biochemistry and Immunology research-wise and then a little bit at the end about the course options that we offer in this school. So really biochemistry and immunology, I would summarise it as a study of cells and molecules in health and disease. For example, one of the things we do is look at the interaction between different types of immune cells. This is a, a lymphocyte and this is a macrophage interacting with each other and I'm going to come back to the relevance of this a little later. The other side of the school is in biochemistry and biochemistry gets inside the cell at the molecules um, of the cell. And those of you who do biology and leaving cell will be familiar with this type of, of slide where the cell is made up of various organelles and one of the major functions of the cell is to make proteins and I'm going to talk a bit about proteins today as a major cell um, product. Um, you've heard of these wonderful names of the endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi apparatus which are involved in protein synthesis. Proteins of course coming from the nucleic acid which is in the nucleus of the cell. Now. Um, one of the things that we do here in the school is to look at the structures of proteins. And protein structure is determined by a number of methods, but the most effective one is, is a technique called X-ray crystallography. And to do this, the scientists make purified proteins and they make crystals of the proteins. It's not unlike a, a, a sugar crystal, except of course sugar is a carbohydrate. But a protein is produced and then it's crystallized. And then an X-ray is used to bombard the, the crystal to get diffraction and from this you can get a structure down to the anatomic level here. So these are actually amino acids that make up and, the, and indeed the atoms that make up those amino acids that eventually make up the proteins. And I'm going to go, show you some examples of this as I go through the talk. Now the structure is determined as I say by this instrument called um, an X-ray um, crystallography instrument and the researchers here, and we have three researcher groups working on this in, in Trinity, they use um, x-ray devices that we have here in the school, but the ones that we have in the school are not really powerful enough to get down to this um, level. So we actually, they have to actually go to Grenoble in the south of France to use what's called the synchroton. And you can see here this massive building with the, the Alps in the background, which is one of the, the most powerful um, instruments in the world. There's another in, in California similar to this, but the one in France is, is the biggest and best one in Europe. And our researchers use this to define the structures of certain proteins. Now, one of the um, molecules that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about is a molecule that's um, on the surface of the influenza virus. Hopefully you'll be all be familiar with influenza virus that causes the flu, which is very much in the uh, media at the moment because of, of swine flu, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. This is sort of a, a cartoon drawing of, of a flu on the upper left. On the lower left, um, the diagram is actually an electron micrograph of what the flu virus really looks like. And the flu virus actually infects the, the, the lung, um, and it does so by... Um, Transmission, usually in the form of a sneeze, as you can see here. So coming back then to the structure of the virus. Virus has got, um, uh, it's self-contained. It has um, nucleic acid in the center. It has proteins around the surface. And there are two major types of proteins. There's one called hemagglutinin, which has this structure. And this is determined, this is one of the first structures of any viral protein to be determined. And there are three monomers making up this beautiful trimeric structure. And the tip of it is the binding site, that, this locking key that I showed you in the movie clip. The second major protein is one called neuraminidase. This is actually an enzyme that's involved in the penetration of the cell across the membrane that I showed you in the, again in the movie clip. Now in terms of drugs and how we treat the virus, the drug that you might have heard in the, in, on the media, Tamiflu, um, targets this molecule, the neuraminidase, whereas vaccines target this molecule, the hemagglutinin. So, 
The hemagglutinin is targeted because it binds to the surface of the epithelial cells I showed you in the movie clip. And if we can block this binding to the, the host cell, then the virus can no longer replicate. And we block the binding by the body making molecules. Again, these are more proteins called antibodies. And this is the beautiful structure of an antibody with two functional domains here called a fab region and a tail region called an FC. So this, body, this molecule of the immune system is, is, is absolutely crucial in preventing the virus from binding to the host cell. Now, normally the body, if it hasn't seen the virus before, won't have any of these antibodies, but once we get infected or get vaccinated, we make these antibodies and they prevent subsequent infection by binding to the viral hemagglutinin molecule. So, one of the things did, that happens in these viruses is that they mutate. They change their structure every year or two. So, this is graphically depicted here. So this, is, this is light blue becomes a different color. Eventually, it is very different a few years on. So there's mutations occurring every few years in this structure. So while the antibodies can prevent the infection with the ver version here, as this changes, and this is just depicted here by a changing color, those antibodies are no longer able to bind because the structure has changed. And this explains why we need to get the vaccine every year or every second year, or if we get infected one year, two years later, we're not necessarily protected because the virus has evolved and changed. Now again, um, some of you may have heard in the media about the, the swine flu, which we're currently having a, a problem again this winter with. This virus can infect humans, but it also can infect birds, in particular ducks and geese and, and chickens. It can also infect pigs. And these viruses can interchange between humans and um, uh, avian species, um, ducks, and be between pigs and humans. And what happened um, about three years ago, sorry, let me go back to that one. <laughs> I'll give you a preview of something which I'm going to come back to. What happened about three years ago, there was transmission between um, a human and swine, and that, cl that clip actually showed you how it can happen, um, where pigs, um, were in close contact with humans and the virus actually transmitted from a pig to a human. And what you got was a recombinant virus which was made up a bit of the virus from the pig, a bit from the human, and there was also a bit of an avian um, virus in this recombinant virus. And this is one that caused the problems. Now this virus went back and was able to infect humans but then it was able to infect human to human and then it became very serious and that's why it was, we, we now have this um, vaccination program to, stop, to try and stop its transmission. Of course this um, illustrates how um, we can get um, human to human transmission of the virus. Another virus that we work on in, um, in Trinity is um, hepatitis C virus. This is a virus that affects about 200 million people around the world. This is a normal healthy liver and you can see it's nice and pink and um, looks pretty good. This is a liver from a person in advanced liver disease from hepatitis C virus infection. And this is advanced cirrhosis of the liver. This can also be induced by alcohol, let me warn you. So excessive alcohol consumption can result in, in this happening to your liver. This can also go on to, to, to liver cancer and the patients can die from this disease. Now there's a number of groups here in Trinity work in our department working on hepatitis C virus. And one group headed by um, Professor Clean O'Farley with uh, Dr. Nigel Stevenson is looking at this interesting molecule called STAT3. STAT3 is an example of a molecule of life which can be um, attacked in a certain way by this virus, the hepatitis C virus. This is a confocal image taken by a powerful microscope that we have in the department. And the green fluorescence in the outer part of this cell, this is a cell from a, um, the body of the, uh, the, from the blood of the patients that are infected. This is in a healthy individual, and you can see the green outer fluorescence. But in the patient with hepatitis C virus, it's absent. But if you treat the cells with this inhibitor of a proteasome, and I'm going to tell you in a second what a proteasome is, this is, a, this is a, a intracellular um, molecule inside the cell, if you treat it with this inhibitor, you now see that the hepatitis C virus infected cell has this protein on its surface. So 
The proteasome is a beautiful structure, and again, um, uh, the, the group of Dr. Amir Khan here in Trinity, in our, in our school, is working on the structures of molecules like this and others, and this is a beautiful structure. This is showing it head-on. These are all the alpha helices, and um, it's, uh, this is a, a side-on view of the, of, the, um, of the structure. So what this research going on in Dr. Farley's lab suggests is that this molecule which the, called the proteasome, which is normally involved in, 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 in disposal of unwanted proteins in the body when, the, when their function is, is, fun, is over, is actually deliberately deleting in the hepatitis C virus per, um, infected people this a crucial STAT3 protein. So what we think is happening is that this is, this is the structure of the STAT3 protein, that the STAT3 is actually being chopped up by the proteasome. So this essential molecule has been removed from the body from the patient with the hepatitis C virus infection. And that means that the body is not able to fight. And this, this stat three molecule is crucial in the immune response. So the, the, the virus is able to evade the immune response then because this crucial molecule has been taken out of the system by the proteasome. So that's a little bit on, on viruses. Um, we also work on bacteria. Bacteria come in various um, 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 forms. And one of them, or two of them, that we work on again in the school, and is a, a Dr. Rachel McLaughlin is one of the people in our school working on this. She works on um, Staphylococcus. Now, Staphylococcus, again, some of you will have heard of MRSA. This is methicillin-resistant Staph aureus. So, um, Staph is a big problem in hospitals, and um, many of these bacteria are now resistant to conventional antibiotics, so they're becoming a serious issue. So we're looking at ways of killing this bacteria outside of conventional antibiotic treatment. Another interesting bug is Streptococcus. Streptococcus, this is the throat of a person who has a very severe sore throat, you see these red spots. This is somebody who has a streptococcal uh, throat infection very sore. So when you get a raw sore throat, you think you have, some people say you have a, 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 um, um, a, a, a flu. Well, it's not flu, it's caused by a bacteria. So a raw sore throat is usually caused by a streptococcus. It can be caused by some viruses, but, you, but, but flu is a different type of disease where you really are very ill. So bacteria size-wise, this is the tip of a pin, and these are the bacteria that are on the pin. So that gives you some idea of the size. In the concept of the immunology that we do in the school, we're interested in how the immune system can deal with bacteria. And these beautiful cells, phagocytic cells, can um, engulf and phagocytose the bacteria. So these are macrophages or, or dendritic cells. They have these beautiful dendrite structures. You can see the bacteria is attaching. The bacteria is shown here in green, attaching to the structure. You can he see here the bacteria is going inside the cell. And again, you can see it here. And um, I'm going to now try and sh show you a movie of how a special cell of the body called a neutrophil can actually, this is a real life news movie. This is not an animation. This is, this is actually taken by a special, this is the, macro, this is the neutrophil. You see it chasing the, the, the bacteria. This is the bacteria in front of it. These are red cells. So it's still chasing. There it is. It's gone inside it now. You see the bacteria is now inside the neutrophil. So the neutrophil, that's, that's a real image. That wasn't an animation. That was a real image of a neutrophil killing, catching and killing a bacteria. So uh, um, as I said, Rachel McLaughlin in the school is looking at how these neutrophils are activated and how um, they kill bacteria. Another area we work on is on cancer. Now, cancer is um, caused by uncontrolled growth of human, normal human cells. This is an image of a breast cancer cell, and it has this um, beautiful morphology, but of course, it, it grows uncontrolled. The current treatment for mostly is based on radiotherapy, chemotherapy, and anyone who knows anyone who has cancer will know that people get very sick when they're on this treatment. Number of groups around the world, including my own lab, actually is working on less toxic treatments for cancer, either drugs that kill the cancer cells or vaccines that harness the immune system to kill the cancer cell. And this is an image of how the immune system can deal with cancer. 
These are lymphocytes, killer lymphocytes, which are attacking a cancer cell and eventually killing it. So the immune system can actually kill a cancer cell. But um, mostly the immune system is not able to do that and it needs to be harnessed in a better way to do it and that's one of the things we're doing um, is making, making the immune system stronger to deal with cancer by vaccination. Now another group in the school, um, um, Ken Mox group, is working on this wonderful co protein called Hamlet which is involved in anti-tumor um, functions. Hamlet is actually um, a molecule that's made up of um, two pr um, a protein and a fatty acid, a protein called alpha-lactalbumin which is found actually in breast milk. The protein is um, uh, when it complexes with this fatty acid called oleic acid, it becomes Hamlet. Hamlet stands for human alpha-lactalbumin alpha made lethal for tumor cells. So what the, the Hamlet does, it goes inside the cell and it thwarts the various replicative mechanisms within the cell. And what's very nice about this, it, it induces cell death in the tumor or cancer cell but it doesn't affect the normal cells because a lot the, the trouble with conventional chemotherapy is it kills normal cells as well as the tumor cells. That's why we get very sick, anyone who has to take um, chemotherapy. Now what, what, what um, Dr. Mock has been doing is looking at the structure of this using um, a system called atomic force microscopy. And this beautiful image here, it's like a, um, a mountain structure, but this is, this is actually a droplet of fat, the, the oleic acid that I mentioned to you, and this is the protein surrounding that structure. And this structure here is able to penetrate the cancer cells and kill them. So just the evidence for this is shown here. This is a confocal, again we have an instrument in the, in, we have several of these, we have four confocal microscopes in the department, but we can use these microscopes to look inside the cell and this is showing the, the, in the red we have the Hamlet molecule penetrating the cell into the cytoplasm, eventually into the nucleus as you can see here. If this is a cancer cell, these cells, this is the normal cytoplasm of the cell, the nuclear material, and now this cell has been actually killed. And this is be better seen here. Um, again, this is the Hamlet treated cell, this is a control treated cell, and as you can see the Hamlet treated cancer cell is this molecule is found throughout the cytoplasm and shown with the arrow here is, a, is what we call an apoptotic body. This is a, a remnant of a dead cell. So these cells have all now been killed by this Hamlet. So just to prove that this really works in vivo, that what I showed you was in vitro in the test tube, this is in vitro. So if we inject a tumor into a mouse and then inject the mouse with the Hamlet molecule and then look at a control which is shown here versus a treated which is shown on the right. You can see this is magnetic, magnetic resonance um, imaging of the brain of the, of the, of the rat which, um, where the tumour will grow. This particular tumour is a brain tumour. And as you can see there's quite a big tumour here and there are other tumours here and here. But in the treated um, rats there are virtually no tumours. So there's just small areas of growth here compared with the controls which are much larger. And this is graphically shown here, or, or, or um, more scientifically shown, the Hamlet treated ones has a much smaller volume of tumour compared with, the, with the, the control. This was then taken into clinical trials where it was used to treat a, a skin cancer called papilloma. And the patients were given four um, treatments with the Hamlet molecule and then they looked at various times afterwards. This is before treatment, you can see a very big tumour here. This is immediately after treatment, this is at follow-up. And as you can see in another patient shown here, there's a dramatic reduction in the size of the tumour after treating with this molecule. So this is showing you um, how you know, discoveries made in labs can have a, meal, a real effect on human diseases. So just to summarize what is um, going on in our school, um, I, I think I've given you some flavor of the research activity. We have about 200 researchers in total in the school. and These are made up of 22 PIs. Um, a PI is um, um, a principal investigator. These would be group leaders, some people like myself who will be leading research groups. We have postdoctoral fellows. These are people who have done PhDs and really at, at um, fifth level training. And then we have fourth level, which is our PhD students. We have 76 PhD students in the school. And we have um, 45 undergraduates. Now all of our undergraduates do mini projects in their final year. So they will come into the lab 
and they will spend 12 weeks doing research. So when, if you come and do science in Trinity and you go and do biochemistry and immunology, in your final year, you'll spend 12 weeks in a lab doing real research. Uh, and um, it's very exciting because you're involved in cutting edge uh, um, um, research. We have state-of-the-art labs and equipment. Last year, um, our income for research in the department was 11 million euro um, from outside sources. So we raised this money by writing grant applications. And some of the examples of the sort of activities that are going on in the school, we're interested in inflammation. I didn't talk about this at all. So this, is a, this is shows somebody with a disease called rheumatoid arthritis. We have a, a, a large interest in structural biology. And I mentioned and I showed you some of the structures that we have generated. We have an interest in vaccines. We have an interest in cancer. We have also a group working on drug design. This is based around structures, using the structures to design molecules that are used in the treatments of various diseases. So it's a, a very interesting and very medically applicable discipline. This shows some of the instruments that would be found in the school. This is a, a fax um, machine, fluorescent activated cell sorting. It's used for identifying different cells in the body and the blood and showing their function. This is an NMR machine, which the chemists and biochemists use to get the structure of proteins. This is a confocal microscope, and I showed you an image from this. So we would put cells in a, 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 on a slide here and look at their structure. Um, this is a tissue culture facility, so when we work with cells, we need to keep them sterile, away from um, bacteria and um, contaminants in the air. So all the air inside where this lady is working is all completely sterile, and it's very clean conditions, and we have labs like this here in Trinity. So this, that's a flavor of some of the, of the facilities. Our school will be moving to a new building this year. This is a, the building here. It's about 200 meters from where you're sitting on Pierce Street, just outside the, bound, the walls of the, the campus. It's a 150 million euro building, which has just been completed. Um, this is, it's on 10 floors. This is a railway station here, Westland Row, or, or, or um, um, I've forgotten what its most, <laughs> its most recent name is, but it's Westland Row. And as you can see, these are the, it's eventually going to have the interconnector, the, the, the metro interconnector coming underneath this building, actually, to, to link up with the railway station. But this is the, going to be the new entrance to the railway station through our new building. The new building is going to have labs, and um, um, the ground floor is actually going to be retail. But all of the rest of it is going to be labs um, and uh, facilities for teaching. So the, the areas that of research will be um, carried out here would be including um, our school biochemistry and immunology, parts of pharmacy, parts of medicine, chemistry, and bioenergy engineering. Immunology will be a big focus, drug discovery, medical devices, um, also um, industry academic collaborative space. So we will have startup companies um, who have set out Trinity. I was involved too uh, about four or five years ago with a few colleagues. We set up a startup biotech company, which at its peak um, employed 23 people. Um, so this is a sort of products of what we do in, in, the, in the research. Just finally then, just to tell you what the courses are, and that's why you're really here today. Um, um, natural science, you know, is TRO71. There are four, currently there are four um, degrees that we offer, biochemistry with cell biology, biochemistry with structural biology, biochemistry with immunology, molecular medicine. We're also involved with the School of Medicine in Human Health and Diseases, which was TRO56. Um, now, this is going to change slightly in 2012. Biochemistry is going to be a standalone discipline. Immunology will be a standalone dis uh, discipline, and we'll, reta we'll retain molecular medicine. So it'll be very simple. It'll be biochemistry, immunology, or molecular medicine. And we do hope that um, you would consider biochemistry and immunology. Um, um, I'm very happy to take any questions you'd like to um, um, ask me. Thank you. Any questions? OK. Feel free to come down and ask me if there's anything you want to ask you don't want to shout out. OK, thank you.